Good evening. I am Marilyn Davis, Area Director of Government Affairs at Altice USA and member of the Greater New York Chapter of the Lynx Incorporated. Thank you for taking the time to join us this evening as we have an amazing panel of ex experts to whom we would like to share with you and share their story about how we can protect ourselves as COVID continues. Tonight's virtual town hall is entitled, How's Your Health? How to Stay Healthy and Whole During COVID 2.0. Next, I'd like to introduce to you our president. But before, I, before she speaks, I'd like to read her bio. President Donna Jones is a passionate leader who has devoted her life to her family, profession, philanthropic endeavors, and her spiritual growth. She has worked in the field of education for more than 28 years in positions ranging from accountant to superintendent of schools. She currently serves as the superintendent of schools for the Patchogue Medford School District in Suffolk County, where she strives daily to improve the learning experiences for students and staff as she continues to foster strong relationships with the community. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Donna Jones, president of the Greater New York Chapter of the Lynx Incorporated. Thank you so much, Marilyn, for your very kind words. And I bring you greetings this evening from the Greater New York Chapter of the Lynx Incorporated. And I certainly want to wish uh, a hearty welcome to all that are joining us this evening. And I want to recognize this distinguished panel of experts that is here today, along with so many of our sister links from the greater New York chapter that are here because we truly believe in the cause uh, of uh, addressing some of the disparities that are affecting communities of color. So I want to wish a, and acknowledge the McSilver Institute for all that they have done to partner with the Greater New York Chapter. They have been absolutely amazing and we couldn't do half of what we've done without their commitment to excellence and their support. Our chapter is committed overall in serving and empowering women and girls in the five boroughs. Uh, we specifically work with the Fred Frederick Douglass Academy to empower women and girls. But in the midst of the pandemic, we quickly recognize the, the, the need and the disparities in communities of color. We recognize that they needed, there were food insecurities, there were challenges with how to navigate the pandemic, there were stressors mentally, emotionally, socially, and certainly economically. We quickly recognized the need for a task force to address the needs of our communities of color. And without uh, having to ask twice, uh, Rosemont Louis, Louis Pierre, I'm sorry, Rosemont Pierre Louis attorney and chief operating officer for the McSilver uh, Institute and our dear sister Ling determined that she was gonna rise to chair this, um, this call to action and this COVID task force. She has done an incredible pulling together a number of the sisters that you see on this call and so many others to address food, does, um, food insecurities, uh, mental and emotional supports through webinars, and so, so much more uh, all throughout the Harlem community, Brooklyn, and all of the five boroughs. We thank her. We thank the task force. We thank the collaboration of our facets this evening to pull this together and certainly our mar moderator for the evening, Marilyn Davis. I um, just want to once again welcome you on behalf of the Greater New York Chapter and I hope that this will be an informative evening for us all. Thank you so much, Marilyn. Thank you, President Jones. Again, welcome to tonight's virtual town hall entitled, How's Your Health? 
staying healthy and whole through COVID 2.0. I'd like to take a moment to recognize the co-sponsors of tonight's event. Again, the Greater New York Chapter of the Lynx Incorporated, the Health and Human Services Facet, the National Trends and Services Facet, and the McSilver Institute for Poverty Policy and Research at New York University. The program will be starting shortly. Um, tonight's program will be recorded and made available on the McSilver Institute and the Greater New York Lynx websites at a later date. And again, um, the bios are going to be in the chat, but I'm going to give you a brief um, uh, introduction to our panelists. First, I'd like to introduce Dr. Michael Lindsay. Dr. Michael Lindsay is a noted scholar in the fields of child and adolescent mental health, as well as a leader in the search for knowledge and solutions to generational poverty and inequality. He is the executive director of the McSilver Institute for Poverty Policy and Research at New York University, the Constance and Martin Silver Professor of Poverty Studies at NYU Silver School of Social Work and an Aspen Health Innovators Fellow. He was appointed Dean of the Silver School starting in July, 2022. Without further ado, I bring to you Dr. Michael Lindsay to speak on the topic of, 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 mind, of being whole. Dr. Lindsay, if you could speak on the impact of the pandemic upon the mental health of the members of our communities, especially upon our young people and our seniors. Absolutely. So thank you for having me. It's a great pleasure to be here with you all to talk about such an important topic. I'm actually going to frame my uh, discussion points uh, among three different uh, age demographics. So I'm going to talk about older adults, young adults, and children. Uh, so first for older adults, um, you know, there's been um, a, a great deal of, of impact, obviously, related to COVID on, on our community, um, and certainly among older adults. Uh, we, out of abundance of caution, have wanted uh, our older uh, loved ones to be isolated uh, because we felt, uh, and, and certainly the uh, science told us that they were particularly vulnerable. And so out of that isolation, you can imagine then has developed uh, a lot of loneliness, uh, depression. In fact, because we've all lived in fear of contracting um, COVID-19, um, many of us have isolated ourselves, but one in four adults uh, 65 and older have reported uh, diagnosable anxiety or depression. Um, and certainly we've all experienced loss. And, and again, those who are older have been um, more vulnerable. Um, and so the data has, has told us that uh, among uh, racial and ethnic groups that disproportionately black and um, Hispanic older adults more than any other racial and ethnic group report that they have um, had a greater impact of, of COVID uh, in terms of how it has impacted their community, their loved ones, et cetera. Um, and, and, and so certainly it has had a, a huge impact on older adults. Um, for young adults, one in four 18 to 24 year olds have actually said that they have considered suicide in the last month. Uh, there was one study that reported that 80% of college students um, said that they felt lonely or isolated, disappointed, or sad, sadness related to being disrupted in terms of their educational experience. Uh, they're more likely than adults to report substance use and suicidal thoughts. And then in children, uh, one in five children have reported depression or have indicated that they, ha that they had little interest in doing things. Um, in terms of those who have been unfortunately visiting the ER related to a a, a mental health crisis, uh, there was a 24% increase for five to 11 year olds from, 2020, from 2020 to 2021, uh, a 24% increase in visits to the ER. For um, 12 to 17 year olds, there was a 31% increase in ER visits. Uh, and then among the 12 to 17 year olds, there was a 50% increase in suicide attempts 
uh, one study reported. So again, the, the, there are alarming uh, statistics related to the impact of COVID and I can share some resources uh, later on if uh, we can get to that point, but um, certainly those are the things that uh, we're seeing taking a, a broad scale look at how COVID has impacted um, the mental health of uh, many Americans, particularly those who are Hispanic or Black. Thank you, Dr. Lindsay. We're gonna take questions from the audience. So if you have questions, please post them in the chat and we will get to those questions after the panelists speak. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Nanette Thomas. Dr. Thomas, Dr. Alexander Thomas is the Medical Director of Ambulatory Care at Brookdale University Medical Center, where she supervises the clinical care of a bustling ambulatory program with over 65,000 visits per year, as well as occupational health services. Dr. Alexander Thomas worked for over a decade in long-term care management where she served as the system medical director for St. Vincent's Catholic Medical Center and Village Care before returning to ambulatory care as a medical director for an FQHC in Brooklyn, and then as director of ambulatory care at Woodhull Medical Center, which is part of NYC Health Hospitals. Dr. Nanette, um, can you also speak about the importance of uh, how, how COVID and the, and the COVID vaccine, the boosters, uh, what have we learned from the COVID, um, from, from the from medical, from the vaccines and boosters? Uh, good afternoon. And again, thanks to everyone for inviting me to participate in this extremely important webinar. Um, I think a lot has happened in our last two years. Uh, we've learned a lot about the virus. Uh, just taking us back to the early days in March and April of 2020, um, when we were first uh, learning about this new virus and how quickly it spread across New York City and then the country. And unfortunately, we had large numbers of individuals falling ill, being hospitalized, and a large number who were dying. Um, I serve in a community which is primarily African American. And uh, there was a large amount of concern and uh, um, feeling that they were separated to some degree from the rest of the community um, because of, of prior uh, history of inequity around the African-American community, the uh, confusion that was occurring at the time with uh, prior political uh, uh, inhabitants. Um, there was so much uh, misinformation that was being shared on social medicine. We had an explosion of uh, cases in the uh, central Brooklyn area. And at that time, hospitalizations for African Americans was almost three times that of our Caucasian uh, members. And our death rate was approximately two times that of um, uh, other uh, uh, individuals in the New York City area. Um, it took a lot to try and convince individuals to try and get the vaccine. Um, they felt that it could increase their risk of impotence, uh, not being able to have children. Uh, they felt that the government was somehow monitoring their behavior through use of the vaccine. So it took a lot of uh, uh, education, a lot of convincing, a lot of um, proving to our community that we ourselves were taking it. Um, and eventually our numbers in the community began to increase. Um, even with our most recent um, surge of COVID vaccine, of, of COVID infection, um, we are finally beginning to see a large number of our community um, accepting not only the second vaccine, if it's uh, an mRNA vaccine that they received, and getting booster shots. And even though the Omicron variant, which was the most recent um, cause of our surge, uh, caused an extraordinary number of um, uh, new cases, um, the risk of hospitalization and death was much less. Um, so uh, we feel part of that was related to the fact that a large number of uh, individuals now are vaccine protected. They've gotten boosters 
And uh, we know that it's not only the antibody protection that you are getting with the uh, vaccines, it's the fact that you're stimulating another group of cells called T cells, which actually give us more memory uh, toward um, uh, maintaining safety against the vaccine in the future. So uh, the number of uh, vaccines that you've received certainly are helping to keep you safe. And the variant that we've more recently been exposed to is less virulent, meaning that uh, the risk of having severe infection, hospitalization, or death is much less. So because of that risk and the fact that overall the um, United States is uh, close to 80% vaccinated, um, we are beginning to loosen the belt on uh, protection, uh, prevention, and uh, we're now at a point where uh, certain counties, depending on their case risk, are beginning to loosen the mask mandate. And we're seeing that um, happening in New York City as of next week, where uh, children will be allowed to stay in school and not have to wear their mask, which is wonderful. Um, we're also decreasing uh, the need for um, uh, maintaining six feet from each other and avoiding indoor spaces and having to wear masks there. So we are seeing ourselves slowly coming back to um, life before COVID. And um, if we talk about just generally staying healthy um, and what gives us the best chance of not getting infected or generally just having good health, um, I strongly recommend uh, maintaining a good size um, one of the high risks that we saw with COVID infection is that patients who were obese, and that means having a BMI greater than 30, um, they were at significant high risk for getting COVID infection and for having serious um, complications related to the infection. Um, so maintaining a good size, exercising regularly at least three times a week for 30 minutes, um, good aerobic exercise, um, that is best to help ward off um, not only gaining weight, but we, we know that uh, exercises decreases your risk of stroke, heart attack. It also helps to maintain good cognition so that you don't develop dementia in later age. And it also maintains good strength in your muscles and your bones so that you do not become frail and that you're able you know, to get around and uh, enjoy a, a functional and healthy life. So um, again, these are basics in terms of just maintaining good health overall, and certainly specifically around uh, avoiding COVID infection in the future. Doctor, I will say this: I certainly have gained, had my uh, share of uh, gained my share of weight. Mm -hmm. I would call it the COVID fifteen. Um, can you share some recommendations on how those of us who work from home, how we can move a little bit more uh, while we're home, while we're working from home? I definitely believe in having things at home where that you can use um, instead of always thinking that you have to go to a gym, which uh, to a large extent may just be another hurdle to get over to go in and, and exercise. Um, so there are a lot of things that you can do at your desk. Um, oftentimes I would have small weights and I would just, uh, you know, to just relax for a few minutes in between sitting at the desk, just take your weights and start using them. You can get weights for your legs also. There's also equipment that you can have and put under your desk where you can cycle and that helps to keep you moving, um, that helps you burn calories and it helps keep, your, keep you awake and, and uh, I think a lot more productive at work. Um, but overall, I, I strongly recommend at least three times a week getting engaged in some form of aerobic exercise with friends. Um, if you talk about mental health, it's a great opportunity to be with your loved ones, um, to get out and just enjoy your environment, your community, um, and spend time with a loved one. Over the last two years, I've tried every diet under the sun. So any recommendations you have for how we can improve our diet again while we're still at home? Um, Eating in moderation. Um, I know the nutritionists uh, very much, you know, will look at your plate of food and they will recommend that uh, two thirds of it um, should be vegetables. 
um, a smaller amount of it being a starch or a complex carbohydrate, and then another smaller portion of protein. Um, and of course, to avoid high caloric drinks. So if you are having ongoing problems with the diet, I won't say so much of a diet, I would say a lifestyle change, um, trying to avoid all of those wonderful snacks and high caloric, high fat foods um, in between, but really just to keep an app that allows you to count all of your calories on a daily basis, um, taking into account everything you eat, everything you drink, anything that goes in your mouth has to be accounted for. And um, my goal when I'm actively trying to lose weight is to try and keep it between 1,200 and 1,500 calories a day, no more than that. My exercise, as I've stated, three times a week. And if you're truly able to do that, um, then you will lose weight. And the anticipated goal is between one and two pounds every week. Those are some great suggestions I will try to incorporate into my life now. And get your friends to help you. We all need to support each other. Go and call you. <laughs> okay. Our final speaker tonight, I, 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 Reverend Dr. Elaine Flake, she has had a long recognized, well, has long been recognized as a powerful pre preacher, teacher, and role model with a gift for reaching worshipers of all ages. The Reverend Margaret Elaine Flake has been impacting the many lives she touches at the Greater Allen AME, AME Cathedral in New York City, where she serves as co-pastor with Reverend Floyd Flake until May 2020. Upon the retirement of Dr. Floyd Flake, she received an appointment as senior pastor. She continues to dedicate her life to the betterment of others by leading in Christian education, evangelistic, and outreach ministries. Without further ado, I to bring to you Reverend Dr. Elaine Flake to, to share a few comments. And Dr. Flake, one of the things that happened in 2020 is that we pivoted from in-person worship to online worship. Can you share with us some of the challenges that churches and especially the cathedral experienced in making that shift? And also what lessons or what best practices have you learned? Well, first of all, let me thank you so much for this opportunity. And I certainly want to uh, celebrate the Greater New York chapter of the Lynx uh, for uh, not only affording me this opportunity, but also for uh, calling us together to uh, think about and to act on some things that are very important. Now, if there's one thing that I think that this season of pandemic uh, revealed it is that um, we were forced to deal with a reality for which we were not prepared. There's just no way any of us would ever have imagined that we would be here not four or five years ago. So <clears throat> as people of color, we had learned how to navigate the waters of racism and the, the waters of marginalization uh, we knew what it meant to be Black in America and uh, deal with injustices, but this, this uh, uh, was something that baffled our minds and our spirituality was challenged, not just um, uh, congregation members, but also as spiritual leaders. We uh, 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 were baffled because our sense of security a sense of safety, our sense of familiarity was just shattered. And uh, many I found who had become lax in prayer uh, and church attendance began to pray a little bit more and even long for, for spiritual, a spiritual connection that would carry them through a pool of emotions that they had never known. So uh, many have said to me, over the past few uh, months that it has been their spirituality, uh, uh, Mr. Lindsay, their spirituality that saved their sanity during COVID-19. Um, and uh, one of the things that I am clear about, I think uh, COVID-19 uh, for us brought about a season of grief. Um, <clears throat> we had to grieve the loss of what we had known, we had to grieve uh, the, you know, the loss of um, our normalcy. And um, many would say that their spirituality helped them through that season of grief, you know, the stages of grief, 
what is it? Um, uh, I think denial, anger, uh, bargaining, all of those things that I think we all had to do as we were in those early days of COVID-19. And let me say this, it is a proven fact that religion uh, gets stronger, spirituality gets stronger in times of crisis. Um, uh, when there's a spike in distress, when there's a spike in disorientation, uh, there's also a spike in spirituality. I can remember that the weeks following 9-11, church attendance grew exponentially. But this pandemic was different because uh, the church doors were closed. And so uh, there was no Sunday morning gatherings. There were no funerals uh, or, or there had to be Zoom funerals for loved ones and friends. Everybody had to become accustomed to virtual worship if they wanted to worship, Zoom meetings and just seasons of isolation and even the FaceTime visits with loved ones in the hospital, all of this brought about a sense of, you know, well, well anxiety and fear, and yes, even depression. Uh, and those things could have stolen our sanity. But I dare say that uh, because many of us were not only concerned about our physical health, but we were also concerned about the health of our minds and the health of our souls, many found out that it was their spirituality that would get them through their difficult times. And so I realized that just as many were anxious to get back to Broadway, anxious to get back to the Barclays Center, anxious to get back to Carnegie Hall, many were anxious to get back to the house of worship, to their houses of worship. And so while I realized that online worship is here to stay, I personally understood the need that others had to come back into the sanctuary because human connection is very much a part of our faith traditions. And while we know that the world has changed and our understanding of religion and our understanding of worship has had to be redefined, we are fully aware that it is incumbent upon us as faith leaders to try to bring back that sense of normalcy uh, because people needed to be together. People need, some people needed to be together and needed to be able to come to their houses of worship. And so I just say that we are, we are treading these waters very carefully because we just don't know what the future holds. But I always say that we know who holds the future and that our days of spirit and, 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 and that our spirituality is that which gives us the hope that better days are coming and that indeed we will be kept even during these difficult times. So we're, we're inching back into worship uh, uh, and I'm glad about that. But we also know, we also know that come what will or come what may, we must stay connected. And so staying connected is what is going to keep us and get us through any difficult situation. And Dr. Flake, for those who were disconnected from the church before COVID, how can they shore up their faith and uphold one another during this time mm -hmm. as we re-enter re into society? Well, you know, uh, I, I laugh because the, the two years previous to COVID, I was, be, I was very much distressed because so many uh, people in the faith community had opted out of church attendance and many of them were worshiping online. And so I, was, I spent all of this time saying, you all need to come back, you need to come back to the sanctuary. And then come March, 2020, when that came, it, it was a matter of, okay, we've got to learn how to worship online now. Uh, and so, uh, I would just say that we must be concerned about our soul care. We must be because soul care is very intric intricately tied to mental health. And uh, we hearing uh, Dr. Uh, Lindsay talk about uh, suicide rates increasing, depression increasing, one of the things that I believe that can help that, not to say that it is a, a cure-all, but I, one of the things that I think that can help that is community. 
and community in a worship in a religious setting or a spiritual setting certainly can give us a kind of power that we need to uh, to carry ourselves through this difficult time. Thank you, Dr. Flake. So we have many friends who are overachievers, who are lawyers and doctors, and, though, and some of them, especially the lawyers in particular, um, have been working from home as well. And some may be displaying signs of depression, but don't necessarily recognize or acknowledge that they are depressed. Mm -hmm. How can we support our friends? Now I'm gonna open this question to the panel. How mm -hmm. can we support our friends who may be displaying signs of depression, but don't necessarily acknowledge that they are depressed. And I pose that question to start with Dr. 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 Lindsay. Yes, um, so it's a great point. I think that one of the things that often can be confusing is that depression is a very debilitating condition. And so when someone is depressed, you're going to see a change in functioning. You're going to see uh, sort of uh, a tendency to not have the energy or the ability to concentrate, or even from um, you know, the great points that Dr. Thomas was making about the importance of exercise uh, or eating healthy or, or eating at all. You're going to see the, the manifestation of someone struggling with depression and so a challenge then is that, uh, you know, it's such a stigma in our community that people might fake it until they make it or try to overcompensate uh, with respect to uh, not sort of displaying the visible signs of depression. But the reality is that if we're really tuned into our loved ones, and I think that this is an important point to make that we should be really attuned to our loved ones to the extent that we are monitoring and we know that there is something going on. Even if they're trying to fake it or, or cover it up, we know that there is a need for some support or perhaps we should be connecting them to some source of, of, of help. And so I just wanna make that point very clear that um, you know we typically know that if we're attuned to things, our loved one is struggling with an issue that requires some professional attention. And so I think one of the things we can do is, 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 is pay greater attention to that and, and really hone in. Instead of sort of asking someone, for example, how, how they're doing, you know, it's easy for someone to say, I'm fine, you know, but to really get folks that we love to touch base with their feelings. And, and really understand how are they feeling? What, what makes them feel that way? You know, to really probe and engage them in those meaningful ways, I think, can make all the difference in the world. Thank you. I, I also want to focus on young people. But before you respond or acknowledge the challenge that young people have, I just want to remind the audience to please post your questions in the chat and we'll certainly present them to the, to the panelists. But for young people, and especially young black boys who spend all day playing PlayStation or some type of, of game, how can we make sure that they are not depressed? Um, and how can we make sure that they are um, getting the treatment that they need? Yeah, well, it's interesting when we talk about children because they are going to manifest their uh, depression symptoms very different. Um, and the, the thing for black and brown children that becomes really important is that the way that their depression might manifest would then be misinterpreted. And it's usually a punitive response in terms of how we uh, support them or come to, uh, to, to pay attention to what is happening with them. And so uh, just specifically, mm -hmm. the, the key is that children tend to externalize or act out their depression symptoms. You may see anger or explosive burst of anger, uh, volatility. Um, and then, you know, sometimes and our work bears this out, some of our research suggests this, that kids may actually want you to pull it out of them. In other words, they may do things um, that would 
trigger your attention. And then they want you to probe what's happening with them because they're not going to readily say, I have this concern or I'm worried about that. Uh, unless you've developed that kind of rapport where you have that open dialogue with, with your child to be able to uh, open that space for them to, to be reflective about uh, what's happening in their lives. And so in, uh, in absence of that, you're going to have a child that wants you to, to pull it out of them. And so I would encourage to look at that manifest behavior, the anger, the you know, volatility, and unpack it a bit to understand then that there's something that's underneath all of that manifest behavior that is crying for help that wants you to engage it in a way that then allows that kid to express what's happening with them. Dr. Lindsay, I think the point you made is so valuable. That I'm going to ask you to repeat yourself again, just in case mother was distracted and she didn't hear what you said. Because, um, you know, we're busy people, right? We're multitasking. and We probably didn't hear that point. I think it's worth repeating that so that mothers and fathers understand how to communicate with their children and how to see uh, the signs that it, their child may be depressed. So if you don't mind repeating that, just give us another quick summary. But certainly, I think it's worth repeating because people do not... Uh, some people, right? Some people are so busy trying to, you know, work and provide meals and and, and, and be providers to their children that they're not necessarily attuned to perhaps that their child could be depressed. Yeah. So you're going to see a uh, a change in functioning, uh, you know, poor grades, all of that sort of stuff. But kids typically express their depression in outward ways, uh, anger, uh, irritability. Uh, explosive burst that we might say or or respond to it as uh, that kid is being bad or being disrespectful. We may uh, respond in punitive ways, but essentially what the kid is asking for is for you to unpack and understand what's going on underneath all of that. There could be fear, anxiety. Uh, it could be some trauma that they haven't revealed to you yet. But in other words, you're going to see that manifest behavior but it's begging for someone to engage it at another level. And so being open, having um, that safe space to articulate what's happening uh, so that the kids feel uh, uh, open and, 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 and honest about being able to convey those things to their parents becomes really important. Dr. Lizzie, thank you so much for being obedient tonight. <laughs> Um, I just want to remind everyone that in the chat, the McSilver Institute has provided resources that I hope that you will take, uh, not only to use for yourself, but take back to your community to make sure that others and our family and our, uh, our workplaces take advantage of the resources. And again, taking the points that Dr. Lindsay just made and certainly share that with your friends and as you see children act out, as we would say in the South, um, so that we can recognize that there's an there's a, a underlying issue there. Um, and I also want to correct myself, so please do not put questions in the chat, put your questions in the Q&A section, and in the Q&A section, Dr. Flake, we do have a question for you, and the question is, um, how has your church um, supported or promoted or provided counseling for your church members? Well, uh, one of the things that I would say, the first thing, you know, we have been in very intentional in sermon preparation to address many of the issues, the mental health uh, issues that Dr. Uh, Lindsay talked about, as well as um, some spiritual issues that we knew uh, were relevant and were very much operative during this time of pandemic. Uh, there are situations in which we have, well, for example, we have a, a, a ministry grief called Grief Share uh, so that people who have lost loved ones during the pandemic, I think they come together every Saturday and, and talk through that whole, that whole uh, process of grieving and uh, dealing with not only loss, but the absence of community when many of them had to bury parents or, or, or spouses. And so that has certainly been one way. And, you know, I think many are do, many of the ministers on our staff are doing um, virtual counseling. That's, you know, kind of how we have 
been able to help others navigate those waters. Uh, also, you know, we do, uh, one of the things that I have done, and I think it helped, uh, for the last two years, I've had nightly prayer for 20 minutes, 8.20 to 8, uh, from 8 o'clock to 8.20. And, and so many people have felt that that was a lifeline for them. So just trying to, um, just trying to, to really be attuned to where people are and to the, new, uh, the needs of people. Our, our elderly people were not prepared to become virtual congregants. Uh, many of them still had flip phones. And so we've had to try to, we have it so that people can actually call into service because they can't engage, they, you know, they don't know about YouTube. They can't do Facebook. So, so they call in and listen, but just being aware of the dynamics. And even as Dr. Lindsay said, um, our young people are not engaging. They would come to church, but they're not on Facebook and they're not getting up at nine o'clock. To, to watch a worship service. And so they are floundering spiritually. You know, they're not getting the community. Many of them are not getting the community uh, 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 connection that they had before pandemic. And so we're trying to, you know, you try to find things for the kids to do. Um, it is really an ongoing uh, uh, process for us who are in leadership to try to to stay connected because many people are disconnected. Children are disconnected. Grieving people are disconnected. So we try to offer opportunities for people to come together and hopefully they will take advantage of the opportunities that we offer. Many do, but many don't. Thank you, Dr. Flake. Over the last two years, we've had many conversations about mental health and protecting your mental health during this time. How do we see, I'm gonna say seize this moment, but seize this moment to challenge the stigma of mental health in our community and getting the support and counseling that we need, not just during COVID, but after COVID. And I'll pose that question to Dr. Thomas. <laughs> well, there's always been a stigma. And I, I think you, you've you already raised the point that in the African American community, it's always been of concern to talk about feelings, to talk about feeling down, needing help, reaching out and speaking to therapists. Um, I think COVID has made it a little bit more real because so many more people have been talking about it. Um, you see a lot of your pop stars who have talked about it. Um, if you're a tennis fan, you've seen Naomi Osaka, who's had to take time off um, from the circuit because she's dealing with mental health issues. I feel like it's become a lot more um, approachable, a conversation, and um, people are feeling less less concerned about hearing others mention that they need help, that they need assistance. Um, at the beginning of COVID, I will say that, um, you know, we're, we often screen our adult population for depression because we know as we get older, um, the risk uh, certainly increases. Um, and with COVID, with these additional stressors, mm -hmm. patients were coming in um, with a lot more anxiety, um, a change in affect, a change in the way that they were able to work, et cetera. Um, and when you're trying to make a referral for behavioral health assistance, I find now that there is a lot less resistance to doing that. Um, people are accepting help. They understand that sometimes uh, talking it through uh, makes a huge amount of difference. And for those individuals who may need medication, um, again, less resistance and just more willingness to accept that um, they need assistance with their mental health. So I think in some ways, uh, having gone through COVID has made us all become a lot more sensitive to the issue and we're um, more willing to share and talk about it. Thank you. I, I, would, I would add, that's really great, um, uh, Dr. Thomas. I would add that at the same time, we've seen uh, an over uh, sort of outreach, if that makes sense, to behavioral health professionals to the extent that in our 
professional community of behavioral health professionals, we are starting to realize that it's not enough of us. There are not enough of us, you know, in terms of particularly when you talk about people of color and providers of color. Um, and so there's a real dearth of professionals available. I'm, all, I'm often telling young folks mm -hmm. that if you want a career to go into, uh, the behavioral health career is certainly one that uh, is uh, very open and lots of opportunity is available. Um, and so I think that, uh, what do we do about that, right? Um, you know, I, I wrote the note down uh, from Reverend Flake that, um, that you know, we should be concerned about our soul care and certainly connecting to our spiritual communities become really important um, that, to the extent that we can count on our loved ones or really come together as a family becomes really important because, uh, you know, social support and being in the midst of loved ones is a protective factor against the experience of a mental health challenge. And certainly the more people that you are around that are loving and care for you can also have an opportunity to, uh, to see your needs and to engage you around any challenges that you're having. And so uh, I wanna just emphasize the importance of that too, to, to, to connect with our communities um, and, and, and really uh, you know, get within uh, that community of support that one might need until they're able to get to a professional for help if that's needed. One other thing I'd like to say is that I think that the, the increase of suicides among people of color has frightened uh, uh, has frightened people of color. Uh, you know, there used to be an old saying that black folk didn't kill themselves. But we are learning, you know, just in the last few weeks, we saw the son of Regina King and then uh, uh, Chesley Christ. Uh, you know, that jarred a lot of people. And I, I think that many now are a little bit more open to mental health uh, counseling. Uh, than they perhaps were two or three years ago, because this this pandemic has really made us have to come face to face with with mental health and the realities therein. Thank you, Dr. Flake. We have four questions in the in the Q and A, so I want to ask the first one, and I'm going to ask each of you to respond to each question, if you don't mind. Is teletherapy a helpful option for the Black community? Oh. Is teletherapy and it is helpful in every community. Um, I think what we saw again through COVID is that we were able to pivot quite a lot in doing telemedicine visits, not only around psychotherapy, but also around primary care. Um, it's a great opportunity, and especially in a field where we are with limited resources, um, it becomes a lot easier to be able to uh, have a greater number of people that you are seeing in your day when you're doing it via telemedicine. And it's a lot of it is talk therapy. So the same discussion that you would have um, face to face, you're able to do um, remotely. But um, the patients, I think, also feel a, a, some sense of comfort in being able to have a conversation in their own home. Um, so it has worked well, and we know that likely after COVID, a lot of tele teletherapy will remain. It's a great option. So can you also share what resources are missing from Black men and boys um, that they're not, uh, that they're not getting the treatment they need? And, and Michelle, if I didn't ask, ask the question the way you, you wanted, it, please feel free to re- type the question, but uh, Michelle asks, are black men and boys are impacted by a multitude of intersectionalities? What is missing in services and resources to, to, as, to prevent or intervene um, when it's needed? Well, in large part, um, you know, the, the, the behaviors of, of, of black men and boys, and now you know we're we're learning even among black girls, or um, you know even brown girls, right? That there's often a misinterpretation of the behavior, um, and so as I mentioned earlier, there's a punitive response to the to the behavior. So we see, for example, more 
police officers showing up to schools than we see behavioral health professionals, right? Um, that's an indictment on our society and, and, and how we view um, black and brown people. You know, we view them to be dangerous and they need to be corrected and all that sort of stuff, right? So um, I think that's what's missing is uh, the lack of attunement to, you know, the issues that might be, as I said earlier, underlying the manifest behavior. And so uh, we need greater uh, work around understanding what implicit biases are and how we engage in them on a daily basis. Sometimes when our friends or family is in the middle of a crisis, we're, we're immediately, we, we suggest that they get therapy, but sometimes even our friends who again are overachievers and well accomplished don't know how to go about seeking African-American therapists. Are there any resources that we can tap into um, if we're interested in finding an African-American therapist? Well, um, it's almost like trying to find a needle in a haystack. Um, you know, across all of the behavioral health professionals, only 4% of behavioral health professionals are Black. So we would be lucky if we found one, uh, which is why I was saying earlier, uh, we need more um, you know, people of color uh, and people from historically marginalized groups, quite frankly, to go into behavioral health professions so that when those who represent historically marginalized groups go to a professional with that kind of support, they'll see someone that looks like them or that represents their historical experience. I think that is true. Um, you, you can oftentimes feel very comfortable seeing someone who looks like you and may have a common interests or background, but um, these are trained professionals. And I think it's really more critical to accept help and find a competent therapist, um, whatever their background. I totally agree. You know, I could just add to that. I often have um, outreach from parents around the country who have followed our work and will say, I want a black male therapist for my son. And I say to them, we need to find your son a therapist uh, first and foremost. Um, and, and so, yeah, I, I totally agree with you, Dr. Thomas. That's a great, great point. So on any given college campus where there are black and brown students, um, black in particular, most of the students are majoring in some type of liberal arts, whether it's sociology, psychology, most times trying to self-medicate as they pursue their academic career or political science. How do we get more black students into the behavioral health profession? Because sometimes they lack exposure or lack understanding. They may want to be a counselor, but don't understand, hey, I can go one step further and be a, a, a behavioral health um, professional. So how do we get students exposed to the career? Well, there are a lot of different avenues to becoming a behavioral health um, uh, consultant. Uh, one is to uh, receive a PhD and uh, become a licensed a psychologist. You can become a psychiatrist after you've received your medical degree and you go on for additional residency training. You may also become a social worker, have um, additional uh, education so that you can become a licensed certified social worker who can then do therapy. Um, I believe there are some master's programs where you can do therapy also outside of being a social worker. So are there are a lot of different ways to come to that same uh, product. And um, I guess really just exposure and understanding that the opportunity is very much uh, available to a lot of people of color. Can I just make one point, uh, shameless plug, but I am going to be the incoming dean of the Silver School of Social Work at NYU, and we welcome all people of historically marginalized groups to come to the school. We uh, welcome you to apply, and we are going to be welcoming uh, folks from those groups. And at the same time, I feel a sense of responsibility to go out to communities, uh, whether you're talking about historically Black colleges and universities or other settings where we can recruit and, uh, and bring those folks, uh, if they're willing to, to, our, to our school. 
So um, I feel that sense of responsibility as well. Great, thank you. And I also want to remind the audience that there are resources in the chat. Um, the Steve Fund um, is at, was added to our resource page. So please uh, pres- um, review the Steve Fund information to find therapists. Um, the, our last question is, what are your thoughts on screening children in many white private schools? Um, some of them are being screened for trauma and linked to resources. What are your thoughts on that? for those who have kids in private school? Um, so if I understand the question, is it that what do, what do I think about screening kids and, and in particular for trauma? Uh, you know, I'm all for that. I'm all for screening kids if it's going to lead to identifying a kid who needs the support that requires a professional to address it. Um, you know, I worry about lack of screening or lack of attunement to the issues. And, you know, that kid might unfortunately have a, uh, a consequential outcome um, that uh, we wouldn't want. And so I'm all for screening if it certainly will increase the opportunity to provide support for that kid and family. Thank you. Uh, I know that we are coming to the close of our hour. I just want to thank our amazing panel for the, your, the information you imparted today. I hope the audience will leave here tonight, one, um, exploring mental health um, uh, resources and sharing the resources with others. And as Dr. Thomas said, get moving, like Michelle Obama, get moving. Uh, don't just become uh, complacent. Um, and, and as Reverend Dr. Flake mentioned to us today, um, certainly reconnect with the church. Um, and there are resources in the church and certainly um, take advantage of the resources, the opportunities to interact with other people, to um, explore and develop your spirituality. Uh, so we hope that tonight's programming was informative and that people will um, certainly take advantage of the information that was shared tonight. Finally, I just want to say this um, town hall was recorded and it will be available on the Mixed Silver Institute and the Greater New York Links chapter um, website. And so we look forward to um, you uh, reviewing and sharing the information with your network. And again, I thank everyone and thank the panels, especially for taking time out of your day um, to participate in tonight's program. Thank you.